Hi there, good afternoon, good morning folks, wherever you are. Um, I'm really excited today to have the pleasure of speaking with Brett Fessel. Brett Fessel works for RCA, which is a tribally owned uh, design management and uh, project management team. And uh, this is the environmental project manager and also former tribal employee. So Brett, um, tell people a little bit about what you're doing here and uh, if you see a dog come in and out here people, uh, the dog's name is Bear and Bear is very keen to be on camera with us too. Yeah, he's just a pup so he, <laughs> he doesn't know what the heck he's doing. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I came to work for the Grand Traverse Band Ottawa Chippewa back in 95 as a uh, fish and wildlife biologist and program director. and over the last 20 years had been engaged in a number of different projects and, and um, aspects of, of the tribe including treaty rights, hunting and fishing and so on and then got into restoration work and that was uh, for the most part derived from my personal distaste or uh, dissatisfaction over the, the actual consent decree that was negotiated with the state of Michigan and that the tribes and the state would often sit at the table and talk about and argue and basically divide up the pie of fisheries in lakes and streams so that everybody got an equal share which is fine but my thought was why should we divide up the pie and sit and argue over these things when we can restore resources and, and environment so that we don't have to, the pie is so big that we don't have to divide it up. And uh, so that's kind of the way I looked at it and, and um, you know, used my connections and some of my abilities in writing to start pursuing funding grants for restoration work throughout the region. and. Uh, from that point forward, that was probably ten last ten years at the department with the tribe. Carried it to the next step and was hired on <coughs> with, with the uh, with RCA <coughs> hey, <laughs> as a project manager to bid on and to hopefully win the actual implementation phase of Orban Dam removal and then maybe beyond that. So let's talk a little bit because some of the people here probably don't know anything much about this project. So can, can you give us an introduction to one, where you're sat right now, whereabouts we are in the country, and uh, two, with regards to the largest dam removal project in Michigan, um, why it's a good thing for both the people and for the environment? Sure. Yeah. So we're we're situated right now in uh, Traverse City, Michigan, which is uh, right on Grand Traverse Bay, Lake Michigan. It's a uh, picturesque, beautiful place, um, highly traveled or highly visited by tourists and uh, you know, a very popular place. And the Boardman River flows into Grand Traverse Bay, contributing about 30% of the, of the water that actually flows into the, into the bay. And uh, the, the Boardman is also impounded or has been impounded by four dams. Uh, starting with Union Street in, in downtown Traverse City, up to Sabin, which is where we're sitting now, just below Sabin Dam, a few miles upstream. And then Boardman Dam is one mile up beyond that. And Brown Bridge Dam used to be, key, used to be um, another 20 miles upstream from, from this point, basically. And we removed that in 2012. So we're now working on uh, removal of Boardman Dam and then the next phase will be for Sabin so that'll <clears throat> that'll essentially make the Boardman River barrier free um, for the first time in over a century and uh, th that's a big deal um, and the removal of three dams you know, as I mentioned there are four the last dam is at Union Street downtown that'll be modified such that fisheries and other aquatic organisms can pass freely up and down the system while at the same time preventing uh, non-native or 
exotic species from getting up into the system, which again will be the first of its kind in the world. If it's if it's designed and built, it'll be the only system in place that allows for that sort of uh, ability to pass selectively these fish. So um, this system is is quite unique in its in its features and quality. Um, but it doesn't make it more val any more valuable or uh, you know special, I guess, than any other river system that flows into the Great Lakes. So we're setting an example here and trying to develop a uh, a template, so to speak, a model for which can be used on other systems in the Great Lakes um, to free them, you know, from the from the binds of dams. I mean, they, these. They, Hydroelectric and other types of dams have been probably the most impactful issue on Great Lakes fisheries that we know to this day. Can you explain a little bit, because there is a, there's a, a school of thought out there when someone says hydropower, that it's an environmentally friendly form of energy, it's a green energy and it's, and it's something that's good for the environment. Can you explain a little bit where maybe that isn't quite the story? There's, and how and how it affects the environment in a negative way for us. Sure, and that's a that's a great question. It's it's so common. It's it's really uh, hard to imagine, but it's all relative. Okay, so when you mention green power or green energy, people will get caught up in the semantics over that. It's not green. It's there are impacts, so you can't call it green. Well, compared to coal or other uh, petroleum-based energy sources sure it's it's probably um it's cleaner than that it's better to the for the environment than that source of energy however there are other impacts that hydros have and i mentioned just previously the impacts on the great lakes think of it from a scale perspective 20 percent of the fresh water on the planet sits here in the great lakes and the ecologic and biologic communities that are supported in that system are all very, or historically, have been very closely tied to the, the river systems that feed into it. So when you dam them up, now that now you've created some substantial negative impacts on, on the Great Lakes fisheries by virtue of eliminating the places that they can migrate in, into rivers. And so the dams are in effect having a significant cumulative effect in addition to some other localized uh, effects that they will have, and that's temperature, raising temperature, eliminating or reducing the amount of sediment um, and other materials to migrate from the watershed, up in the watershed down, which, you know, the three functions of a river are to transport water, sediment, and uh, biological uh, entities, if you will, or organisms. So, in that regard, it is, you know, it's not a reasonable solution to, to power, much in comparison to something like uh, wind power or solar. And we know even wind power has some impacts on wildlife species. So it, it is, it's all relative, really. So you talk about this, this bringing the river back to, it, to its original state. I mean, originally, I believe this river was called the Ottawa River. Um, and then it became the Boardman River through, um, can you talk a little bit about the history of, of the river itself? Sure. Well, <laughs> uh, us Europeans are great at telling our own story and, and really making our mark and, and improving the land, quote, improving uh, the resources to suit us, right? So when this area was settled back in the uh, early 1800s they discovered the timber that were you know that was it that was so thick in this in this region much like everywhere else and rivers are the primary conduit or way to move that timber out of the out of the forest and the watershed to the coast to be shipped on out to places like Chicago and other um, cities and so in a nutshell <clears throat> The individual 
that was here and, and sort of spearheaded the efforts of harvest of that timber in this watershed was, was Boardman. Um, that was his last name and he used a lot of the money that he made, contributed towards the community to some extent, so in, his, in essence he became this great famous guy, therefore uh, they named the river after him. Um, and nobody really thought to talk to or ask the indigenous peoples here what they called this river. However, it did show up on early maps before settlement here as the Ottawa, as you spoke. So, um, you know, really that's, that's the unfortunate part of, of the way we tended to occupy these new lands is to just kind of take it over, rename it as if it was nameless and nobody ever knew anything about it. And so, um, that's sort of the effort here too, is once we restore the river and its function and its physical characteristics, it's only logical to restore its name. You know, its original name as it was before, before the impoundments or the dams and the obstructions were in place. Yeah, in fact, in one of the other videos of this series, we spoke with the uh, former uh, Grand Travers Bay keeper, Emeritus John, um, who talked a lot about uh, about the importance of that and his role um, alongside the tr alongside the tribe in yeah. looking to get that name um, changed because it's a simple process, but there's a lot involved uh, right. involved with that process. Yeah. Um, so, you know, going forward, what are some of the advantages, because I know a lot of people, unfortunately, don't put the environment ahead of people. So, from from the standpoint of the people that live in this area, what is the advantages to having the dams removed on the, on this on this waterway for recreational and, uh, and that side of things as well? Well, more and more, uh, with the advent of, so to speak, of the, the inexpensive kayak, I mean, decade ago or more if you wanted to buy a kayak you're gonna spend six eight hundred dollars you know or more and they made they've been able to you know reduce the process and make them available to virtually everybody so that's a really popular activity now and uh, obviously when you have barriers in place and those barriers create backwaters that are still and slow. Uh, it's not the greatest for canoeing or or kayaking, um, just because you, you're going to spend more energy doing it. If you came to float a river, you want to be on a river and not on a river, then a lake, then a river, then a lake. So without the impoundments uh, in place after removal, um, that that type of use of this system will will be substantially more popular and bring in economic um, inputs from that and so there will be this sort of increase in in value in a way to people uh, in that sort of free-flowing state um, not to mention we build dams where the highest gradient in systems exist because that's where the energy is that's where flowing water the energy potential from going from a high place to a low place <laughs> is the highest it's the most there's the most energy being generated there so that's where that's where the dams will be put and consequently when you remove them you're gonna have some really popular uh, stretches of river that that whitewater folks like. Absolutely. Hey, Bear. So, um, <laughs> the other the other side to this as well. Obviously, this is this is fished a lot, yeah. and by changing this river back to its original state and reducing the temperature, what kind of things are we going to see with regards to the levels and also the types of fish that are within this river? Another good question, a common one, and because uh, I had a question a couple of years ago from a a local angler and resident on the river um, asking about the size of trout, the size of brown trout that he might expect to catch. And will they get these big, heavy um, brown trout that they have historically um, seen in this system fishing with dry flies and like during the mayfly hatch. 
And uh, the answer isn't easy because these impoundments can tend to act as little growing uh, chambers for some of these trout. So, and then they'll migrate up out of these stiller water, these still waters, uh, into the river for fishermen to catch, and they love that. So, without them, you might see fewer of these giant, almost abnormally large fish, trout, and on the. But to the contrary, you're going to see more, more of them. So the production, the numbers are going to be higher, and so that's, you know. We have to kind of consider what it is that we expect out of our, our resources. I mean, do we, is that all we need is just big fish? Or do we want a diversity of species, even, even though you might see smaller um, individuals? And so it's always a difficult one or a challenging one to, uh, to answer for folks because fishermen like big fish. They like to tell the stories. And uh, well, I can't, I'm not going to try and lie or, or evade that question by saying, yeah, it's going to be fine. You're going to see all these big fish. Well, they're still going to be there. They're, they're just going to have to work a little harder to catch them. Um, what about the types of fish? Because obviously you talked about the temperature change with, yep. within this river and the fact that I went out with uh, Nate Winkler from uh, the Conservation Resource Alliance and we stopped and we saw at the side there's these uh, these uh, uh uh, cold, cold water springs yep. all, al all along the river here. So this is a very unique river in that sense because it never free. This doesn't freeze throughout the winter that because of those springs. It's, it stays about forty degrees. Right, right. So this is what you would call a classic blue ribbon trout stream or a trout stream, cold water trout stream, which means in general you have four, typically four species. You have brook trout, brown trout. Sculpin and maybe some darters, you know, and I'm not I'm not saying that in you know a flippant way or anything, but the diversity tends to be fairly narrow but high quality with those species of fish. Now the reason that you only will typically see that in large part, especially on smaller streams, is because there's a barrier somewhere in place downstream that has it that has not been able or allowed. Other native species that can't jump. Key, key point here. Every native species in Michigan or the Great Lakes don't jump. They can't leap over barriers. Pacific salmon and steelhead and even brown trout, on the other hand, they evolved in systems where they had to ascend mountains. They had to climb mountains. So they have adapted to be able to jump over barriers. They can ascend. Uh, fish ladder so if the decision is made to allow those species up into this system could substantially change the dynamics or the the ecology of the fisheries right on down through the invertebrates um, as a result <clears throat> so it's something that we really need to think about because the goal uh, really is to allow for as many native species as we can like walleye and pike and lake trout whitefish I mean, the list is long um, to be able to re use this system again and I mean in, even in the short time this project started back in 2012 was the first that with first dam removal even in that short time they've started to see some uh, flips with regards to brown trout to brook trout right um, so we can clearly see this is making a difference. And as someone said in the comments, this is about having the river flow as it normally would, just, just to simply be a river yep. without our interference. Um, so what's next for, what's next for you um, regarding uh, this project and looking at making sure that um, this continues down the, down the same path? So <clears throat> now uh, as a sort of a contractor on the other side of working uh, on the government, or with the government, the tribe. Um, the next dam to plan to be removed is Sabin, just upstream from here. And the, uh, as far as we know, the that job or that contract should go out to bid sometime this fall. And as you know, in my job, that's what I'll do is pursue. Uh, 
projects like that, contracts, and bid on them and competitively uh, try and secure that kind of work. And so that'll be one um, that I'll be looking for personally. And also we spend, there's a large amount of, of habitat work that still needs to be d done after these removals occur. Like at Brown Bridge, for example, you draw that pond down, you evacuate it from you know, the water, and all it leaves is the floodplain and some stumps. There's no vegetation immediately after, and it takes a while for it to grow up. And if you look around here, you look at the mature forest that's in the floodplain, that's the target. And that takes two, three centuries sometimes. So we're trying to, and that's both on the banks and in the channel these trees will eventually die and fall into the river and that's important habitat for uh, these these communities so we're trying to jump start that a little bit by adding structure and, and building um, habitat that isn't there now and would take a long time for it to ordinarily set up so that kind of work we'll also be looking at um, upstream of Boardman for example and elsewhere and uh, also just you know continuing to advocate for the for the value of returning these systems to a natural free, free flowing state and and lastly to try and really put together this uh, this model that can be duplicated and shared with other communities that are going to have to deal with dam removal sometime in the future so they're going yeah, absolutely. So I guess before we, we draw this to a close, um, I always like to ask people, what, what, what message would you have for the people that are watching that want to be involved in their area and don't know how to get involved, or maybe are involved but want to help more people become involved, maybe particularly the youth? Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I spent a lot of time, actually when I worked for the tribe, uh, with youth and doing just education outreach and all that really was was taking taking these kids out and getting their hands dirty and showing them things that they wouldn't ordinarily see or they might see them but they don't know what they are so it's it's really um it's really rewarding to take youth out like that and even adults their parents can be the same way and you turn a rock over and you show them this is what this is this is a stone fly this is a mayfly this is a mud minnow whatever and i don't know what it is but as soon as they have an identity they can identify and they know what it is and maybe a little bit of biology the interest just seems to skyrocket so taking that and then carrying it forward to this is you know this is what a healthy system looks like and then have them uh, talk to them about the impacts that we as uh, you know as human beings have had on these systems and the value of trying to return them is uh, you know that's the primary message that I'd like to transfer because you know, sometimes people think of it as just like an e ethereal concept where we're just going to return the river to its natural state that's all well and good but they don't understand why, you know, and and getting down right in it, in my opinion, is it seems to be one of the most influential ways. So, and putting it in sometimes you got to put it in their pocketbook too, you know, try and explain to them in dollars and cents. Um, but I'd prefer to just get their hands dirty. Yeah, I agree. I think that. It getting them maybe out of the house and yes. I I into nature and just reconnecting because a long time ago in my personal opinion a lot of us lost our real connection yeah. to where, where we came from and we've set ourselves apart from nature and truly we are nature right um, yep. yeah we're we like to well we have we acted as God in a way and that we can control nature and rivers are probably the one of the best examples of where that's not true I mean given enough time you'll always the river's always going to do what it has to do so absolutely I guess we just got to put some Pokemon things out in the river <laughs> <laughs> yeah
course, Brett, thank you so much for joining here on a, you know, a Sunday morning. You're taking yeah. your weekend to do this with us, and we really, really appreciate it. My pleasure. All right, thank thanks you. for watching, guys. You take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.